hundred years ago, in the days of King George III, the vast colony of Virginia was a bright gem in England's crown of empire. The capital of Virginia was the city of Williamsburg, small in size, but large in political importance, a city quite as significant in the 18th century as New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. Here, the royal governor lived in his mansion, so elegant that most colonists called it the governor's palace. He was treated with proper deference, for his authority extended from tidewater plantations to the farms of the hill country, and thence over a vast wilderness empire to the Mississippi River and the shores of the Great Lakes. Duke of Gloucester Street was the principal avenue of Williamsburg. Taverns such as Chowning's, the King's Arms, and the famous Raleigh lined this broad public way, as well as craftsman shops and trim private dwelling houses. At the end of the street was the Capitol building itself, the seat of Virginia's government. Here were nurtured the traditions of self-government which were one day to erupt in a war for independence. When the American Revolution came, Williamsburg was capital of the newborn Commonwealth of Virginia. But it was exposed to raiding parties from British men of war, and it was far from the center of Virginia's expanding population. And so, in 1780, the capital was moved to Richmond, and Williamsburg's bright star began to fall. Nineteen twenty six in Tidewater, Virginia. These were the Roaring Twenties. Flappers and sheiks, mahjong and ukuleles, and jazz. Yet in the heart of this modern setting, the past still lives. Alongside these 20th century buildings stand quiet evidences of another time, another pattern of life. And there are some whose eyes can see the pattern, some who see the need to rescue these historic buildings before they crumble into dust. One of these was the Reverend W.A.R. Goodwin, rector of Bruton Parish. Dr. Goodwin had already brought about a restoration of Bruton Church and the restoration or protection of other historic buildings. But his efforts to arouse interest in a restoration of the city itself were unavailing until he met John D. Rockefeller, Jr. During one of Mr. Rockefeller's visits to Williamsburg, Dr. Goodwin showed him photographs of the town he loved. A high school occupied the site of the old palace. But the old courthouse still stood. On the Duke of Gloucester Street alone, a remarkable number of the old buildings remained. Mr. Rockefeller was astonished to learn that so much of the original city still existed. Nowhere in America was there an important colonial city preserving so much of its past, yet of a size making restoration practical. The idea made an especial appeal to Mr. Rockefeller because he believed that America, young as she was, had a tradition which must be preserved. 
Faith needs roots in stone and mortar that the future may learn from the past. After careful study, Mr. Rockefeller decided to recreate the major part of the whole city as a place where his fellow Americans could taste the flavor of history itself. And so the idea of Colonial Williamsburg as a nonprofit educational institution was born under the lifelong interest and guidance of these two men, it was to become an enduring reality. In 1928, the work began. Some modern buildings had to be purchased and destroyed to clear the way for restoration. Whenever possible, however, houses were moved to other locations outside the restored area. An old military map of Williamsburg drawn in the 18th century by a French engineer and preserved by the College of William and Mary became the keystone of the restoration. It confirmed the location of existing buildings and told the architects where to dig for the foundations of those that had disappeared. It became known as the Frenchman's map and excavations proved it to be as accurate as it was complete. The first step taken in the restoration of existing 18th century structures was to study them as completely as possible in their present condition. Notes and measurements of even the smallest details were taken, from hinges to woodwork and masonry, from the carpentry work and joinery, to the types of building materials themselves. The outbuildings adjacent to old houses were carefully studied because they too were to be restored. The outside kitchens and smoke houses, dairies and stables. Even the gardens were to be brought back to their original appearance. And so they were measured and studied too. Now let's watch the process of restoration. This was the Brush Everard house at the time it was purchased, a historic old house slowly falling into ruin. First, workmen made a close examination and exploration of the house itself. framing or internal structure was carefully investigated. Within the limits of safety and convenience, as much of the original work as possible would be left intact. Inside the house, too, the work of investigation proceeded. For example, with the help of the molding comb, the architects could make an exact record of the design of moldings so that those needing replacement would match the original work. Bit by bit, an architectural and historical record of the house was assembled. Plans, photographs, all the information gathered in research. The whole story of the house is here, from the day when it was built to the time it was purchased for restoration. In 
In about 1720, John Brush constructed a simple frame dwelling. Making use of the attic, dormer windows soon appeared, and in a courtyard, the usual outbuildings, a kitchen and a laundry, and an office to conduct business. By 1740, a south wing had been added by a new owner, who also made many other improvements to the property. Around 1760, a north wing was built, and the outbuildings were enlarged as well. The house had now reached its greatest extent and remained the same until a fire burned away the south wing. Rebuilt smaller and with a shed roof, the house began to change its appearance in other ways as well. The laundry building disappeared and the small office building too. Brick walks were covered over. But again, new owners, in keeping with the Greek revival taste of the time, added a small covered porch, and another office was built of brick. Finally, a full balcony porch was added. And this is the way the house appeared immediately prior to restoration. Once the preliminary studies were complete, the restoration began in earnest. Many of the old foundation walls were in such poor condition that they had to be removed and replaced. Modern lath and plaster in bad condition was stripped away to permit strengthening of the internal framing of the walls, which had seriously weakened during the years. When necessary, old window frames or door frames were also replaced. Modern cement mortar was removed, and a colonial type made with the lime from burned oyster shells was substituted. This mortar was pointed in the colonial manner. By peeling down the layers of paint on old woodwork, it was possible to find the colors used in colonial times. Age, however, had darkened the original pigment, and so a lighter shade was used in restoration. And so, at last, the restoration was completed, and the Brush Everard House became once again its 18th century self. The restoration of the Brush Everard House was relatively easy, because most of the necessary research work could be done in Williamsburg itself. In other instances, local research was limited or inadequate. The Wren building, for example, had undergone many changes, and no local records gave an exact knowledge of how the rear roof had originally appeared. At first, the architects were prepared to follow the design of similar buildings, but then they extended their lines of inquiry not only to libraries, colleges, and historical museums in the United States, but in Europe as well. One day in the Bodleian Library at Oxford in England, the most dramatic discovery of the whole restoration was made. Miss Mary Goodwin, Dr. Goodwin's cousin, and her co-worker in research, Miss Cannon, discovered an old engraved plate which had been made for an 18th century English publication. Here were the Wren building, the palace, and the capital, as they really looked in the 18th century. The rear of the Wren building was no longer a problem. The Bodleian plate was radio photo to the architects in Williamsburg and they lost no time in correcting their plans for restoration. The reconstruction of buildings which had completely disappeared was based on accurate records 
and sometimes on surviving architectural details. A piece of molding from a burned house would be copied for later duplication. The discovery of small articles of day-to-day -day living, from dishes to carpenter's tools, added new clues to the growing picture of 18th century life. The very earth of Williamsburg was rich with history. The process of excavating became not merely a necessary preface to reconstruction, but an exploration to be undertaken with care and study. A method of excavation known as cross-trenching was employed. Diagonal trenches served the purpose of a large net thrown across the property, bringing to light not only the foundations of the house and its outbuildings, but often fence post holes, paths, and sometimes even garden plans. County courthouses and public record offices were sources of much information. Old legal documents and business papers yielded valuable data for the reconstruction of buildings that had disappeared. Old insurance policies often contained sketches of house plans, together with measurements and mention of building materials. Citizens of Williamsburg played a vital role in furthering this work of research. They threw open their homes to the historians and architects, letting them rummage through attics and outbuildings. Letters, diaries, and family papers sometimes provided unexpected information about the old city, its life, and its buildings. Even family photographs proved surprisingly helpful. For example, a nostalgic family portrait found in an old trunk provided the researchers with a much needed picture of the Craig House. Because of it, an accurate reconstruction was possible. Another family photograph gave them a front elevation of the Scrivener House. Kipps engravings of 18th century English gardens were one of the bases for the plans of gardens to be reconstructed in Williamsburg, since it was known that these engravings had been widely circulated among Virginians. On the basis of such investigation, the actual reconstruction was going on. The day came when the governor's palace of the Bodleian Plate became a three-dimensional reality. The original palace had burned to the ground at the end of the revolution. The most helpful clues to the former elegance of its furnishings were provided by an inventory which had been drawn up at the death of Lord Botetourt, one of the last British governors. There were indications that the woodwork and paneling of the entrance hall had been in walnut and it was known that the room had contained an array of muskets. Slowly, as many pieces of the jigsaw as possible were fitted together, but there were gaps too that could be filled only by further research. It was agreed that everything, from draperies to furniture, would be as authentic as possible. Authorities on decoration with broad historical knowledge were called in to direct the purchase of furnishings such as the English governors of Virginia had used in the original palace. Since the governors had brought most of their luxurious furnishings with them from Europe, it was to Europe that the researchers returned, seeking out experts in antiques who could help them find articles 
that most closely resembled the ones described in Lord Botetot's inventory. The India print draperies that were finally hung in the ballroom were over 200 years old and might easily have graced the original palace. Even the flower arrangements were done in 18th century style. And the portrait of Charles II had been painted from life by an English court painter of the period. Lord Botetot's inventory listed a crystal chandelier in the supper room, and after a wide search, one answering the description was found in Canton, China. Original hand-painted wallpaper made in China in the 18th century was used to decorate the supper room. The reconstruction of the palace gardens was carefully undertaken from information provided by the Bodleian Plate and from archaeological excavation. Building by building, the city dropped its 20th century appearance and became its former self. Not only old homes, but buildings like Bruton Church and the Wren Building were fully restored according to carefully documented research. Other buildings were reconstructed entirely, outstanding among them the Capitol. Today, Williamsburg is open year-round to thousands of Americans who come with a purpose. A purpose that has to do with the roots of democracy itself. An information center helps the visitor plan his stay so that his days in the old city will be as full and interesting as possible. greatest interest are the exhibition buildings. The elegant governor's palace contrasts with the more modest Brush Everard house. On Duke of Gloucester Street, the Raleigh Tavern is midway between two important public buildings the magazine, and the jail. Located throughout the restored area 
are many shops where the visitor may see 18th century crafts practiced just as they were in colonial days. For example, in one of these shops, he can watch a printer as he sets type. And here, he gains a new sense of history, perhaps. A feeling of closeness to his American forebears. People who printed and read newspapers in a time not so far away as it sometimes seems in a history book. And as he watches, he feels a new respect for the freedom of his press. He remembers, perhaps, that his ancestors fought for this right to print the truth as they saw it. And he remembers that in today's world, too, this freedom must be cherished and protected. For to lose it would be to lose liberty itself. Nowhere, perhaps, is this sense of history so close as it is in the capital, the scene of so many stirring events of the dawn of American independence. The hostess, dressed in wide sweeping farthingale, is not a guide in the usual sense, but rather someone who can help stimulate the imaginations of the visitors so that they can recreate and relive the great events of the past. Perhaps they can imagine the voices of the Burgesses or of Patrick Henry defiantly protesting the Stamp Act or the words of George Mason's Bill of Rights and more loudly still, the voices of Virginia legislatures pledging themselves unanimously for independence, no matter what the cost. For this is the deep and abiding spirit of this room, a spirit from which a philosophy of government and life was born, a spirit which lives now in a new time of crisis, binding together the peoples of the free world today.